Okay, great. Let's get started. Uh, welcome, everybody, um, to today's uh, uh, webinar uh, on inflation, drivers, and dynamics uh, from Central Bank Research Association, CEBRA. My name is Rafael Schöne, um, and I'm one of the co-organizers together with Dominic Smith. And uh, we have an excellent set of speakers today, and um, we have a great moderator, Hassan Afruzi, to whom I'm passing the stage now. Uh, thank you all very much. Thank you, Rafael. Um, welcome, everyone. We're very excited for two presentations today on exchange rate and inflation under weak monetary policy and the geographic effects of monetary policy shocks. I want to especially thank the organizers, Rafael Schonley and Dominic Smith. Uh, the webinar that we have today, just as a reminder, is a 45 minute event with two presentations of approximately 15 minutes each and uh, 10 or 15 minutes of Q&A at the end. Um, attendees will not have the option to switch their audio or video on, but we welcome them to uh, write comments or questions in the Q&A space. Uh, you can, of course, post your questions during the presentation already, and you do not have to wait until the end. That will make it easier for me to uh, uh, relay these questions in the end to our speakers, uh, and they can answer them. Uh, the webinar is also live streamed by the CIBRA YouTube channel. Uh, it's also recorded and made available on CIBRA's website at www.cibra.org and CIBRA YouTube channel after the event. As a disclaimer, participation in a CIBRA webinar does not constitute or imply an endorsement, recommendation, or favoring endorsement of the views, opinions, products, or services of the Central Bank Research Association or any other participating institution, individual, or entity. All views expressed during a CEBRA or CEBRA co-hosted event are strictly those of the authors, discussants, and other participants, and uh, not those of CEBRA, the co-sponsoring institutions, or any other participating institution. With all that behind us, we are very excited to hear from today's speakers, Professor Refet Kurkenak, who is going from Pilkins University, who's going to tell us about exchange rate and inflation under weak monetary policy, Turkey verifies theory, and Professor Juan Herenio, who's an assistant professor of economics at UC San Diego, uh, who will tell us about the geographic effects of monetary policy shocks. Um, I will turn it over now to Refet, who's our first speaker, and I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you so very much. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, so this is work, that, and I'm going to share my slides in a second, uh, with Burcin Kasajikolo and Sang Sok Lee, who are both um, faculty members, fellow faculty members here at Pekent. And this paper is a, I would say, convergence of our two interests, one on um, research and economics broadly, the other one on the more specialized Turkish economy. And oftentimes, for me at least, um, my genuine research work, so to speak, uh, was mostly divorced from my interest in the Turkish economy. And when I wrote on the Turkish economy, it was usually in Turkish because I didn't think anybody else would find this all that terribly interesting. Um, well, as a nice convergence from a personal perspective, in a sense, professionally, but uh, due to an unfortunate reason. Um, if you have been following this at all, you know that Turkey has been implemented some, let me call them funky policies. Um, with anyone um, with a economics training, these policies look like completely unhinged and crazy. And unhinged and crazy policies are terrible for citizens, but constitute excellent experiments for economists. And that's what this paper really is. Um, in particular, and this is where I share my slides. Um, here we are. Okay. Um, in particular, what we would like to talk about um, is a whole bunch of things. And what I will do is to give you an overview of what has been going on in Turkey, what the policy actions were, what likely drove them, and what certainly did not drive them, in what sense these should be considered as exogenous central bank policy changes, and therefore, in what senses these are good controlled experiments for um, economists with applied interests. And given the particular interest that I have and my co-authors share, which is 
central banking, this is a truly interesting episode where we get to test a lot about the less well thought aspects of our monetary theories. It's customary to have a brief outline of a presentation at the beginning and then go through the layers of this. Uh, what's going to happen in this presentation is that I'll just go over the outline and tell you what we are doing. And I'm going to do this very slowly. If you're really interested in any aspect of this, you're more than welcome to look at the paper. Do that tomorrow. We're going to upload a revised version tonight. Um, but it's available on our web pages. So one of the things that we do here is you may know that um, with inflation at about 18%, in the summer of 2021, with a target of five, the Central Bank of Turkey began to cut interest rates. Um, that isn't quite what standard theory prescribes as good policy. What is more interesting is, although this in your face, I'm gonna cut interest rate thing has been more recent in some sense, the Central Bank of Turkey has been using very weak monetary policy for more than a decade now. And in fact, we can easily trace it back to 2010 or so, where the Central Bank began to follow a policy path that was remarkably lower than what any reasonable-ish policy rule would imply. Okay, now, um, in 2010, this was just bizarre. Now we have a term for it. It's called Neofisherian Disinflation. And one of the things this paper does is it puts together in a hopefully well-written section our understanding of what exactly the Fisher effect is, Neofisher effect is, and how the New Keynesian framework fits into all of this. Now I'd like to take a minute or two to talk about this because I'm extrapolating from myself. But my sense is um, a lot of people know the terms, few people actually understand the machinery that goes into this. Um, in particular, that would be me. Uh, we wrote this paper, I uh, had the sense and I thought I understood this. But the first time I presented the paper, I realized that you know, I'm talking about things I don't quite understand. So we sat down and spent some time thinking about what exactly is going on here. So um, pay attention. We have a simple, not equality, identity, that is the Fisher equation that says the nominal short rate is equal to the short real rate plus expected inflation. This is the definition of the real rate, and thus that's a identity, not even a equality, okay? It has to hold regardless, fine. Now, the moment you say, in the long run, monetary policy is neutral and, I understand the effects on R&D, this, that, but by and large, I'm happy to say this. Then at steady state, that real rate is exogenous to policy, meaning if the steady state nominal rate is lower, steady state inflation has to be lower. That is the Fisher effect. The neo Fisher effect is a um, backwards induction argument that effectively works through the expectations augmented Phillips curve, where inflation is something, something, something plus expected inflation. If somehow I have correctly engineered lower nominal rates at steady state, and therefore I have engineered lower inflation at steady state, future inflation is lower, therefore current inflation will be lower. And that is the neo Fisherian disinflation understanding that because I have committed to a lower path of nominal rates forever, the steady state inflation has to be lower. The Phillips curve then implies inflation today will be lower. Thus, I end up lowering inflation by lowering interest rates. Now, one would then have to think, okay, I kind of understand the argument, but how does this fit with the New Keynesian machinery overall, because that machinery tells me that if you cut interest rates, inflation will go up, not down. So how is this consistent? Right? And the right way of thinking about this, and I think this is what was missing in this 
discussion, I'm sure many people did understand this, but for me, I had to work through this myself. Is the, the issue here is to think about the Taylor rule. The Taylor rule says in the simplest form, and it doesn't matter if you have a more funky rule, you know, nominal rate is steady state nominal rate plus a transmission parameter times the inflation deviation from the target plus a shock. Now, if the policy rate is lower on the left-hand side, something on the right-hand side ought to be lower. It cannot be the shock because this is a permanent reduction in the interest rate and you can't have a permanently negative shock. The damn thing has to be mean zero, okay? So something else has to be moving there. There are two ways this can work. One is the inflation target is now lower. The public perceives a lower inflation target credibly, which also lowers inflation, in which case the inflation deviation from the target hasn't changed, but the steady state nominal rate is lower. Hence, the equation holds. The Taylor rule is satisfied with a lower inflation target. Now, what I would like for you to understand is this. Two things, actually. One, the new officiating idea isn't like MMT. Okay, that actually is reasonable theory behind it. There is a case where this can happen, okay? But it doesn't have to happen. And in fact, when it does happen, the causality does not go from having lowered the nominal rate. It goes from having credibly lowered the inflation target and therefore being able to lower the nominal rate with it, okay? Now, the question is, can you commit to lowering the inflation target pursuing a lower inflation target by lowering the nominal rate. Can you push the other argument, okay? It may work, but it doesn't have to. And the good question is, what happens if you try and you fail? Imagine that, like Turkey, your country, and do not try this at home, your country says, I'm gonna lower the nominal rate, okay? And I'm gonna keep it low no matter what. And the public, doesn't say, ooh, okay, you're going for a lower inflation target, I believe you, and therefore inflation is going to go down. The public says, you can't even hit the inflation target you have now, and you're telling me that inflation is going to go down with a lower nominal rate, you're crazy. What happens then, okay? Well, that payment rule still has to be satisfied. And the only way it's going to be satisfied is if the public perceives a lower inflation transmission parameter. Given the gap between actual inflation and target inflation, the public is going to say, ooh, now that I see the central bank cutting interest rates, I understand that I have a central bank that doesn't care about inflation. In which case the Taylor rule is again satisfied with a lower inflation reaction parameter, right? And the problem there is if you lower that parameter sufficiently, you begin to violate the Taylor principle. The real rate doesn't move in the right direction. And therefore, remember your first year graduate school, New Keynesian model training, you're pushed into this situation where the blanchard count conditions tell you infinity of solutions, okay? This is not the case where there are no solutions. This is the case where there is an infinity of solutions, meaning expectations become self-fulfilling. Hence, the world we live in becomes the following. When the central bank says, I'm gonna lower the nominal rate, I'm gonna keep it low forever. The steady state actually does change. There is a steady state now with lower inflation. However, there is no longer a unique bounded path that pushes you towards that steady state. Now you're in a world with self-fulfilling expectations and your inflation is going to jump around. How long? Forever. So the expected time to that steady state is infinity and your inflation is no longer monotonically converging towards that steady state, okay? So the Fisher effect is still there, but it's inapplicable in the sense that there, are, there is no machinery that pushes you to that steady state. And in your Fisherian experiment, if it had worked, it would have been working with the Fisher effect. But when it fails, this is a sentence in the paper that I'm very fond of, where the new Fisherian disinflation fails, new Keynesian indeterminacy begins, okay? And that indeterminacy then says, it doesn't really matter what happens to your steady state because half-life to your steady state is infinity, okay? Now, given that, what was the Turkish monetary policy doing? It was really doing this, okay? That's the only way of properly understanding this. One 
question that immediately comes up is, oh, but wasn't this the fiscal theory of the price level? Wasn't the central bank trying to help the treasury by keeping rates low? And the answer is no. The debt to GDP was low. When we began to implement this low interest rate policy, debt to GDP was 38% of GDP and going down. The CDS spreads of Turkey were at their historic lows. So not only the fiscal situation was good, the financial markets perceived it to be very good too. There was no need for central bank help to the treasury, okay? So it really was um, a combination of hubris, um, misplaced economic not understanding and political pressure because in the 2008-9 crisis, cutting interest rates where the problem was low demand had worked wonders in Turkey. This is common for many developing economies where these countries had actually corrected a lot of their imbalances. And therefore, when the global financial crisis hit, a lot of them increased spending, lower taxes, cut interest rates, you know, did counter-cyclical policy just the way the book prescribes and actually benefited a lot from this. In Turkey, the government then learned, well, you cut interest rates, you grow fast, this seems great, let's do more of this, okay? Then, but the point then here is, um, there's a nice paper by Krishna Patterson and her co-authors for Sweden, where the Central Bank of Sweden uh, begins to jack up interest rates, this is recent, because they're worried about uh, the mortgage market, okay, and house prices, and how, since this is exogenous to the labor market as a whole, how this can be treated as a exogenous macro shock to the labor market, okay? You can think of this paper in that vein too, meaning it's an exogenous policy change and it's not a shock to the policy rule. It's the shock of the policy rule. The rule itself changes, okay? And the change here, unlike the Volcker disinflation, for example, isn't from a bad rule to a good rule, but from a good rule to a bad rule, right? And if you're interested in various implications of this, Turkey tends to have very good data. So I'd encourage you to take a look at the case here. In our case, our interest was on a bunch of macro variables, one of which was the purchasing power parity. As you may know, and I'm going to wrap this up very quickly, purchasing power parity and the expectations hypothesis are two things undergraduates love, and it's great to teach them. And then you have to break their hearts by saying the data hates this, right? But for the PPP case, the tests are usually between country payers that are sufficiently similar in the sense that, you know, we're doing this in the 1990s for the Deutsche Mark and the US dollar. We're doing this, you know, in the 2000s for the you know, British pound versus the Euro. Okay, so what are the inflation differentials? Well, you know, here inflation is 1.8%, there it's 2.1%, and thus we're gonna test whether the exchange rate changed by 0.3%, okay? Well, it may or may not, you know, just the tiniest bit of friction or expectations of this is gonna come back, whatever is going to violate your PTP. So the problem I see there is on, the, on your right-hand side variable, the inflation differential, there isn't sufficient identifying variation. This thing moves very little, actually. Okay, so a much better question is, you know, look at country payers where you know one of them inflation is one and a half percent, and the other one is you know twenty and a half percent. What happens then? For that, you need a country with twenty and a half percent inflation, and there we are. So we test for PPP, and we do a unobserved components model in a bivariate setting, and it asks. What is the correlation of the shocks hitting the trends of inflation and exchange rate depreciation? Okay, and the correlation turns out to be one, right? That's PPP exactly, right? And in fact, we can beat the Misi Rogoff baseline. We can beat in forecasting inflation the random walk forecast, right? Um, then we talk about you know why was this happening? Well, the whole country was going down the drain, bad governance, la la la. If you're interested in political economy, it's kind of there, okay? Then finally, we ask, let's estimate the Taylor rule with time varying parameters. What was happening? We can easily show that the Taylor principle was violated beginning in 2010 or so, okay? Then it becomes a question, how do we think of models where the Taylor principle is violated? Because the standard model is going to tell you 
the world is a world of indeterminacy. In a world of indeterminacy, anything goes. And therefore, although I can take the world that we're living in and say, look, this is consistent with that, anything is consistent with that. That's a test without power, right? So we read models where we can think of weak policy in a world with determinacy, okay? Um, and we, we do two versions of this. One of them is a regime shifting monetary policy where in one regime in itself, the world will be indeterminate. The policy rule is weak, but the other regime is strong enough that overall there's determinacy, okay? And we can show that if you are dinged by an inflation shock in the weak regime, your inflation will go up like crazy. This is nice and says, yeah, the model seems to be telling me what I'm seeing, but the model also says when you get a negative shock, inflation will fall too much because you're not responding to inflation, period. And that's not what we see in the data, right? This is directional, it's asymmetric. So then we introduce, sadly in the Turkish context, the idea of the effective upper bound. And if you're familiar with the effective lower bound literature, this really works in a very similar vein. The effective lower bound is you can't lower the nominal rate below a certain threshold because people will just say, you know, damn it, I'm gonna hold cash. So that's a participation constraint. The effective upper bound is a political constraint. There's a political authority above you that says you can't raise interest rates above whatever you want to be, 3%, 6%, 8%, whatever. The whole point is now when you get negative shock, you can cut interest rates. But when you get positive shocks, you get bound by the effective upper bound. And therefore inflation becomes uncontrolled in the up direction, okay? And these are the senses in which with minor tweaks, our standard models help us understand what we have been seeing in the crazy Turkish macroeconomy. And hence the title of this paper, Turkey Verifies Theory. We use these models to think about policies where there are small deviations in the policy rule or small shocks to the policy rule in a world where the policy rule overall is a good rule. The model has implications about bad rules too. We haven't been observing these because serious countries haven't been running policies of that sort. And one of the aims of this paper is to say, well, Turkey has run very bad policy for a long time. And the model does have implications about this. And in fact, the Turkish outcomes are very consistent with the, what the model says we're gonna see, okay? The last of this, for whoever is interested, is a bunch of snippets, um, event studies from the Turkish case, where we say, you know, look, on this day, the chairman of the central bank was removed. On that day, blah happened. On this day, the government said this, you know, as the central bank was cutting interest rates, this is what was happening to the inflation rate. Um, and those things work in opposite directions, as would be prescribed by the new Keynesian model, right? Um, we ended up with inflation so far peaking at 85%, right? Um, and for those of you who are interested in such things, you know, when the central bank uses its policy rate, the overnight rate to do crazy stuff, how it loses control of the longer term rates and how longer term interest rates began to skyrocket as the central bank cut the rates. So we have the event studies of these things in this paper. Thank you. Thank you, Refet. Our next presenter is Juan Carreño. Okay, so um, let me um, share my screen. Okay, so uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk about our work. And um, um, so, so this is joined with Matia Pedemonte, who's at the Cleveland Fed. And so these are our reviews, not those of the Fed. So, so basically what, what we're doing in this paper, I, I think of it as, as a very simple idea, which is try to quantify the effects of monetary policy shocks in a cross section of regions. We're gonna be using US data. Um, and we're gonna do that because we, we have this very buoyant body of evidence that documents that individuals and firms are differentially exposed to monetary policy shocks. And the variables that dictate this differential exposure, call it income, home ownership, demographic variables, so on and so forth, are also dispersed in space. And to the extent that local labor markets 
present imperfect mobility, let's say imperfect mobility of people across locations, or non-tradable components in the consumption baskets of households and so on, then some of the GFX implied by this differential exposure should be contained in local regions. Therefore, you can think of this differential exposure as creating heterogeneity in the sub-blocks of, let's say, the New Keynesian model of a monetary union that we have in mind. So, so with, with that in mind, what we're going to do is we're going to use exogenous changes in the conduct of monetary policy in order to measure what happens in the cross-section of metropolitan areas in the U.S. since 1969 up until the present, depending on the type of shock that we use. We're going to document that in cities where you see that monetary policy shocks create the larger inflation declines, let's say a tightening of monetary policy creates larger inflation declines, those are the same cities that end up having larger employment losses. And we're going to document that those cities tend to be the poorer regions in the US. Now, when you take this movement between employment responses and inflation responses, what you're going to end up having is that this heterogeneity cannot be rationalized by differences in the slope of the Phillips curve across different places. But they end up looking in the model as something that looks like heterogeneity in the slope of the Euler equation across, across places. So, so I'm going to spend most of the time that I have talking about the empirics, and then I'm going to say a couple of words about what, do, what we do in the model. So, so we're going to use Romer Romer shocks in our benchmark specification. We have a robustness about that uh, in a revised version of the paper that is coming up. And we're going to mix that with uh, CPI data coming from BLS for the 28 main metropolitan areas of the US and data um, on private employment counts coming from the quarterly census of employment and wages. So just, just to say a word about the type of data variation, variation in the data that we're going to be exploiting. So here I'm, I'm showing you inflation data for three metropolitan areas in the US, New York City, Detroit, and Houston. And the type of variation that we're going to be exploiting is not the common component, the common movement of, of this inflation series, but the fact that throughout local business cycles, some of these regions end up having larger inflations, let's say during like the oil shocks over here and over here, or during the Volcker disinflation over here, or during the Great Recession, for example, in, in Houston. So, so there is a smaller price variation across cities. You can see that from the data and the variation in employment growth across spaces is way larger. So for example, you have that during the Volcker disinflation, cities like Detroit end up having a larger recession than cities like New York City. Um, and during the recovery, perhaps associated with commodity booms, cities like Houston end up having larger employment gains than cities like New York City or Detroit. So that's kind of like the variation that we're gonna be exploiting in conjunction with the aggregate variation created by the monetary policy shocks. So, so just to uh, clarify the kind of like regression that we're going to be running. So we're going to be running local projections of cumulated inflation at the local level as a function of first, the monetary policy shocks. And we're going to augment that by lags of the dependent variable, um, which is the kosher thing to do. And here I'm going to show you the average results. Okay, so this is what happens in the average city in the US after a monetary policy shock. And this looks very similar to what Romer Romer documented in their original paper, which is that at the beginning you have something of a price puzzle, and then you have declines in the price level uh, that are quote unquote large. Now, if you look at what happens after monetary policy shocks in the cross section of cities, what, what we're going to be showing you here is the impulse response across space at different horizons. So for example, eight quarters about the onset of the shock, so two years after the shock. What you're gonna see is very muted responses also in the cross-section of cities. And as you end up moving a little bit forward in time, so 12 quarters, 16 quarters, 20 quarters, what you end up seeing is that you have larger de price declines in the cross-section of cities, but maintaining a pattern, which is that inflation tends to decrease by more in areas that have lower income. That's what it's depicted in the x-axis over here, rather than in cities that have higher income. So we can impose a little bit more structure into this uh, non-parametric way of running these regressions, which is to exploit our panel structure by augmenting uh, this set of like local projection regressions by an interaction 
of the Romer Romer shocks over here, and a measure of income at the local level. So this is what uh, Cloyne Jordan Taylor called in their paper of blinder Hakka local projections. And so let me tell you how these results look. So, so for the average city, the results look just as before. So this is what happens for a city that has the average income of, of a city in the US. So you have large price declines that are materialized after some time has passed after the shock. But what you see is that for a city that is, for example, $1,000 uh, that has $1,000 higher income than average, what you're going to see is that prices decline by less. So you have differential price responses that are positive um, and that are maintained through a very long period of time. So this is a little bit difficult to interpret the quantitative magnitude of these effects. So what we're going to do that, what we're going to do is to plot the impulse responses for an average city in the US for a city that has an income equal to the 90th percentile of income in the US and for a city that has the 10th percentile of income in the US. And we're going to show here is that the price responses that happen in the average are mainly driven by what happens in cities that are poorer rather than what cities that are richer. In cities that are richer, the inflation effects of these shocks are way milder than, than in cities that have low income. Now we're going to do something similar for employment. Um, we're going to run, we're going to use our, our panel data in which we have employment counts coming from the private sector in CDI at time T. And we're going to exploit the rumor rumor shocks, the monetary policy shocks, in order to capture what happens to employment counts at the local level. So for the average city, what you see is that you have pre-immediate effects coming from employment uh, with a trough in the average city of employment losses at the quarterly level of roughly 1%, and then a, a slight and slow recovery up until um, employment growth completely recovers. We can make the same expansion in which we look not only what happens in the time series in the aggregate level, but we can see what happens in the cross-section of cities. Something that we think is very interesting emerges, which is that if, again, we're going to show the impulse responses across different horizons as a function of the average income per capita of the city, what you see is that two years after the onset of monetary policy shocks, you see negative effects throughout, but they are concentrated in series that happen to be poor. And as time progresses, then you should expect that you return to monetary neutrality in the long run. And that's sort of what you see. So employment starts to recover little by little up until like 20 quarters after the shock, you see no cumulative effects of unemployment um, across in the cross-section of cities as well. So we can depict in the same way that we did for prices, we can depict what happens to these impulse responses in the cross-section of income across the income distribution at the local level. And here I want to highlight that for the average city, what you see is that, again, very similar to what I showed you before, declines in employment that materialize roughly eight quarters in the trough after the onset of the shock, and then uh, uh, a recovery. But what you see for a city that is $1,000 uh, that has $1,000 higher income than average, what you see is basically the mirror effect of the average effect. Okay, so when the average city is suffering employment losses, richer cities are uh, experiencing a relative increase relative to the average that is positive. But that is going to imply that if you see what are the impulse responses uh, of employment growth, after a monetary policy shock across the income distribution. What you're gonna see is that um, for the richer city, you're gonna see very mild effects of monetary policy shocks on employment and very large effects in employment growth for cities that have uh, lower income. A non-parametric way of uh, depicting what is happening in the data, the source of variation in the data, is to compare the impulse responses that we're going to run at the individual level, so city by city, both in inflation and employment. So here in the x-axis, I'm showing you the impulse, the value of the impulse response function for the price level at the local level, 20 quarters after the onset of the shock. And what you see in the 
y-axis is the cumulative effect. So we're adding the employment losses that happen throughout 20 quarters uh, up until 20 quarters after the shock. And what the data is telling you is that there is a positive movement in the cross-section of cities in which cities that experience larger price declines experience larger employment declines as well. So these results that I'm showing you are robust to controlling for a measure of sectoral composition, so broad measures of industry. We're currently working on making these uh, controls a little bit finer. By using different sources of shocks, not only Romer, Romer shocks, but shocks developed, for example, by Miranda Group in Enrico in 2020. They hold, if we control for current and contemporaneous and lag variables at the metropolitan area level, and if we add time fixed effects in order to sock other aggregations. Um, so when you when you take these results and you um, take the standard in case a model of a monetary union, let's say, then you can, we're, we're gonna use that in order to understand what are the sources of variation that could explain this heterogeneity that we see in the data. So we're going to have a very simple model, and this is uh, taken to be as a pedagogical example about the kind of variation that are consistent with this cross-sectional variation across cities. We're going to have a very simple model that has two regions that produce tradable varieties that are differentiated, in which consumers have home bias for the varieties produced at home. We're going to take the very extreme version uh, for pedagogical purposes that there is going to be no labor mobility across regions. And we're going to have a constant share of hand-to-mouth consumers in each regions that are going to be presumably different. This is going to drive some heterogeneity in the strength of demand effects across, across regions. So, so the model, I'm not going to show you the equations, but the households are, are very standard. They're going to consume and supply labor. They're going to be every time, uh, in each point in time, they're going to be on their labor supply curve. Ricardian households are going to be on the Euler equation, so they're going to be uh, deciding consumption growth as a function of uh, local real rates. And hand-to-mouth consumers are going to be consuming their current income. Firms are going to produce only with labor, and they're going to face nominal realities in the form of um, calvo sticky prices. So we're going to solve many variations of this model in which we're going to be changing the dispersion of the share of hand-to-mouth households across regions. So these are, we're going to start from a benchmark in which each region has the same share of hand-to-mouth consumers. We're going to start to create more and more dispersion across the share of hand-to-mouth consumers across regions. So this figure on the x-axis is very similar to what I showed you in the data part. It's going to have a measure of the relative inflation responses across places and a measure of employment of different differences in, empl in employment responses across places. Each pointer is a different model that has the solution of a different model that has a different dispersion in the share of hand-to-mouth consumers. And if the markers are very small, it means that the dispersion across places is very small. If the markers are very large, it means that the dispersion across places is very large. What you see is that when you end up uh, creating variation in the share of hand-to-mouth consumers, which is like dispersion and demand effect, then this positive movement in the effects of monetary policy shocks across space in in inflation in, in employment um, capture very well what you see in the data, which is that places that have larger inflation responses have larger employment responses. And this is, of course, um, in, in contrast to what you would get if you would create, for example, a model in which there are no hand-to-mouth consumers for simplicity, but you allow for a differential extent of nominal rigidities across places. So some places have stickier prices, for example, than some others. So here, the logic of the figure is the same. In the x-axis, I'm showing you the relative inflation responses across places and the relative employment responses across places in the y-axis. Each point is a different model. The size of the marker implies the differences in nominal rigidities across different locations. And if you were to think that um, the what characterizes different regions in the cross sections is these different shares in consumption baskets, for example, that drives differences in the extent of nominal rigidities, what you should see in the data, if that is the predominant source of variation in the data, what you should see is a negative movement between the dispersion in inflation responses with respect to the 
dispersion of employment responses. And this is very intuitive. If some regions have um, more flexible prices because perhaps they consume more goods that have more flexible prices, then that economy is closer to monetary neutrality. Places are flexible. That's the only source of nominal rigidity in the model. So employment responses in that region should be very small. And that's the opposite of what you see in the data. In the data, cities that have larger price responses also have larger employment responses. So we, we move in, in the model to, to talk a, a little bit about the implications of aggregate effects, One. but for, for the sake of time, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop there. I think I was just going to give you one minute, but like, that's great. Thank you for uh, giving us more, more time for questions. Um, so we have five minutes for uh, questions. So I'll jump right into it. Um, I'll start with a question for Rafet. Um, Olivier Coibion asks, you rely on the Taylor principle to assess determinacy in the new Keynesian model, but once we allow for positive steady state inflation, which seems important in this kind of environment, the Taylor principle is not generally sufficient to assess determinacy or indeterminacy. How worried should we be about this issue and the reliance on a model that works low, uh, works well in low inflation settings, but may be more problematic in high inflation environments? This is a good question uh, and something that we have thought about. The Taylor principle by itself, um, I guess the point here is, um, Determinants and indeterminacy are still issues with trend inflation. It's just that the cutoff is no longer at one, um, as in the standard world, right? Um, and uh, if you take a look at the paper, you know, we show the time path of the Turkish inflation reaction function. Um, when you're looking at reaction coefficients that are um, indistinguishable from zero or in negative territory, um, the question of, well, with positive trend inflation, one isn't quite the cutoff, becomes mostly moot. One could, of course, work out exactly where the cutoff is, uh, but you know, any way you rig this model with positive trend inflation, you're still going to face indeterminacy with the kinds of non-reactive policies that Turkey has followed. Thank you. Um, I'll continue with the question for Juan and I'll continue alternating. Um, so, someone um, asks, is the response in this, and which city is significantly different from zero? And uh, if it is, how do you square that with rich cities commanding most of employment and consumption? Yeah, so, so, so that depends. Um... If um, so, if we take the cities, for example, at the 90th percentile of our distribution, and we impose this parametric restriction on the heterogeneous effects in the local projections, then the effects on employment, for example, for those sets of cities, are not distinguishable from zero. Um, now, we can, when we run these regressions at the local level, you can you can take each individual city. Uh, individually and test whether the employment and inflation responses for that particular metropolitan area are significant and significant or not. Um, so, so for for cities other than those at the very right end of the distribution, we're we're getting um, significant effects. It's just that economically they're they're substantially smaller than those in the in, in the lower end of the income distribution. There's a follow-up to that, so I'll just continue if you can give a very short answer. Are you able to show which inflation subcategories are driving the difference between poor and rich areas? And are the differences due to the housing or other um, areas? Yeah, so 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 what you would think from the intuition is that um, the subcategories that drive these responses are those that are, have a, a more important local component in them, those that are more non-tradable. And that's exactly what you see in the data. So if you look at components like shelter or food away from home, the effects are the differential effects are large. And if you look at something that looks very tradable and very uniform like gasoline, then these differential effects are, are very small. So uh, it's due to non-tradability. Great. I'll finish with a question for Afed. Um, 
So I understood your argument. I'll combine it with a question of mine, but this is a question from Rafael Shonley. Um, so I understood your argument to be that when, in, when the government starts or the central bank changes the, the interest rates, it could be interpreted as either a change in the long run inflation or a change in how responsive the central bank is to inflation in the short run. So there's a non invertibility issue there that we can't really invert the signal to one scenario. And there's like many scenarios that are plausible. Um, so alternatively, the central bank can actually communicate that they're doing this uh, policy with the intent of like uh, affecting the long run inflation or with the intent of being less responsive to monetary policy shocks. Well, sorry, with, uh, with respect to inflation, which raises credibility issues. So do you, do you see this as a credibility issue or a communication issue? And building on that, just being more pragmatic, how do you predict in an economy like Turkey or my country, uh, uh, how might one return to stable path and what might be a likely scenario uh, for, for these economies after they enter such a regime? Okay, so this is excellent. Um, I don't think of credibility and communication as separate items. Um, and in particular, um, if you have no credibility, communication is irrelevant, right? And if you're unable to communicate, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're credible or not, because it's not like you're saying anything. Um, and here, again, you know, these are in the paper, um, you know, the president, not the central bank governor, the president came out and said, well, inflation is high. At the time, inflation was pushing 20%-ish. Inflation is high, but it's going to begin to fall because we are transition, transitioning to a low interest rate regime, okay? So this is exactly what you wanted to hear. They, you know, like he actually came out and you know, he is the policymaker, right? But he did came out and said, we're going to lower interest rates and that's going to lower inflation, okay? The point here isn't that, now um, your question is very pertinent in cases where the a central bank might be doing this or doing that, but the central bank, bank is actually capable of doing both, okay? Here, that's not the case. So regardless of what the central bank thinks what they are doing is actually in a misguided but good-willed way is aiming to do whatever, the only thing that matters is what the public perceives to be happening, right? So the central bank actually did come out and say, you know, we're going to lower interest rates and that's going to lower inflation. So this wasn't a lack of communication, but you know, I heard this too, and I looked at this and said, you're crazy, okay? Um, now, you may want to think of this as credibility, which might be, but you might also want to think of this as equilibrium selection in a learnability setting where the good equilibrium here is a very fragile equilibrium, okay? And this is something well understood. So, you know, the moment you begin to think about, well, you know, this may be happening, maybe I am tempted to believe this, but perhaps other people won't be as tempted, right? You immediately go to the bad equilibrium. So I think here the issue goes deeper than uh, the central bank communication and could they have pulled this off? I don't think there was any way they could have pulled this off. In particular, in an environment where your inflation is leagues above your target, when you come up, and say, I'm gonna cut interest rates and that's gonna make the steady state inflation go lower, right? The natural reaction is to say, you can't even hit the high target, let alone lowering your inflation target, right? Um, now, this is not a good statement to make for countries like you know, ours, um, but remember that uh, a lot of countries, including Turkey, but all of Latin America, a lot of places in uh, Southeast Asia, actually did very properly disinflate, right? This is a great political economy question, and I'd be very happy actually if one of these sessions was, uh, were dedicated to it. You know, between 98, the Asian crisis, and 2002, the Argentinian and the Russian crises, right? the entirety of the emerging world had crises. And this was not special. Most of these countries had the same crisis repeatedly in the 1990s. For some reason, the political economy of which is very unclear to me, but I'd love to learn, all of these countries, with the remarkable exception of Argentina and then Venezuela, said, enough is enough, right? We're going to change things. We're going to reform. And all of them did so along similar ways. 
So the answer here is it can be done. But in Turkey, it took changing the fiscal rules, recapitalizing the banks to about 25% of GDP, rewriting the banking law, re-engineering the bank regulator, rewriting the central bank law, bringing in very decent and competent central bankers. And it's that combination that actually works, right? So I have no doubt that if this were to be done again, it's gonna work again because you bring in people and you know, many countries, Turkey is no exception here, is not short of good potential policy makers, but politics make the least able people do these things, right? Bring in good people, people are actually looking forward to being able to say, okay, I see hope here, right? You are able to control expectations. It really helps when the fiscal policy is amenable and then it works. It has worked 20 years ago because, you know, look at the Peru's, Chile's, Israel's of the world that had insane inflation levels and are doing very well now. Great, thank you so much. We are over time. So um, uh, unfortunately we have to end it here. Thank you again, both to our presenters and also to all of the participants. Uh, and uh, we will finish it here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Uh, this was a fantastic moderation with amazing presentations. Um, thank you so much. Um, and uh, hopefully see you in one of the next webinars. Yes, sir. Pleasure. Thank you again. Bye. Thank you.